Judges. The Old Testament book of Judges, please, chapter number 2. And I want you to come with me down to verse number 8, please. The Old Testament book of Judges. And we're in chapter number 2. And we're going to commence to read from verse number 8, please. In Judges chapter 2 and verse 8, we read, And Joshua the son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died, being an hundred and ten years old. And they buried him in the borders of his inheritance, in Timnatheres, in the Mount of Ephraim, on the north side of the hill Gea. And also, all that generation were gathered unto their father. And there arose another generation after them, which knew not the Lord, nor yet the works which he had done for Israel. Amen. And we know that the Lord will add his blessing to the reading of his own precious truth. In the book of Judges, chapter number 17, and in verse 6, also in Judges 21 and verse 25, you'll read this great truth concerning the days, the days of the Judges. In Judges 17 and verse 6, and in Judges 21 and verse 25, this is what you read. And when there was no king in Israel, every man did that which was right in his own eyes. You know, just because, child of God, we do that which is right in our own eyes, it mightn't be right in God's eyes. And in the days of the Judges, throughout the days of the Judges, and throughout the book of Judges, you'll find a pattern path that you'll find from one end of the book to the other. Because what you'll find throughout the book of Judges this morning is a spirit you will seesaw for the people of God. Throughout the book of Judges, you'll see it for yourself. One, at one moment, they are on a spiritual high. And in the next moment, they're in a spiritual low. Times of great blessing. Times of great spiritual apathy. And here's the pattern of path. That runs through the book of Judges this morning. Remorse, repentance, revival, rebellion. Remorse, repentance, revival, rebellion. Remorse, repentance, revival, rebellion. And do you know what that teaches me this morning, child of God? It teaches me, me this. Revival this morning is not the beginning and end of all things, you know. People talk about revival. And we need an outpouring of God's Holy Spirit upon us believers today. But there's one thing I have learned. Revival, when it comes, it must come to the people of God. People say this morning it must commence with the people of God. Yes, but that's only one third of the truth. Revival commences with the people of God. Ah, yes, but it must continue with the people of God. And then revival concludes with the people of God. You see, revival may come, but it doesn't last. Revival came to Ulster in the year of 1859. Yes, it came, but it didn't last. Revival commences with the people of God, first of all, but it must continue. And revival will always conclude with the people of God when the people of God rebel. 
two young girls. See, it's Spurgeon, he's to tell the story. Two young girls were rescued when they were nine years of age from drowning in a pond. The great preacher told how two young men got them out of the pond. They were almost dead. Their life, there was just a flicker of life. The two young men knew how to administer first aid and give them mouth to mouth and brought them round again and they were revived. And one young girl went on to live to the grand old age of 91. Lived a long life whereby the other young girl, she died at 12. She died at 12. She lost her life at 12. Because at 12 years of age, she returned to the same pond in disobedience to her parents. But the next time, there was nobody there to win. The book of Judges this morning is filled with triumphs, wise, great triumphs. But the book of Judges is also filled with great tragedy. And my text this morning that God has placed in my heart is based on a great tragedy. And I believe this text is so relevant to the days of the judges. Let me tell you, the more I looked at this text this week, it's very relevant for us today. Where is my text? I'll tell you where it is. It's in Judges chapter 2, verse 2. Now listen to what God has got to say to us. This is where God's going to speak to us from. And all that generation were gathered unto their fathers. Now here's my text. And there arose another generation after them, which knew not the Lord, nor yet the works which he had done for Israel. There arose another generation which knew not the Lord, nor yet the works which he had done for Israel. There's four things God wants you, and there's four things God wants me to consider this morning, and he wants to speak to you. They're not very willing. The first thing God wants you and I to see in that text that there is a people involved in that text. This is what it says. And there arose another generation. Now here's one fact this morning. Every generation doesn't begin at adulthood. You remember this this morning. Every generation begins at childhood. And there arose another generation. Now this message this morning is not just for those who have children. Some of us this morning have children and they're up and away. Some perhaps this morning hasn't been blessed with children yet. But this is a message for all of us. And it's a message that is so relevant today. And there arose up another generation after them which knew not the Lord. You know, God wants you and I to look this morning at the next generation. The wee generation, the next generation that was on their knees here looking at you a few minutes ago. The next generation that went out through that door and up them stairs to crash. The next generation that sits in that Bible class on a Sunday morning. The next generation that's up in Sunday school. The next generation that is in that annex on a Thursday evening. God wants you and I to concentrate this morning on this generation that's coming after. God has a thing to say. What we face, child of God, in our day when we were young people is nothing compared to what's going to face them we were. 
and there is way for the Lord God. It frightens me and it scares me for the next generation that's coming on. Because mind you, what they will face in our day will be absolutely be disgusting and only. You know, child of God, we must be reminded what Psalm 127 and verse 2 says. It says, No children, we're talking about children, are in heritage of the Lord, and the fruit of the womb is his reward. And God places children into the responsibility of the parent. Mommy this morning, Daddy this morning, you have a responsibility with that child in your home. And the most important school that child will ever attend won't be Queen's University. And it won't be Jordan's town. The most important school that child of yours will ever attend will be the home. And what the child learns in the home is what that child will take with them to them. And the greatest influence that child will ever have and the most spiritual influence that that new child or any child will have will come from the parents. Listen, it doesn't begin at Sunday school. If you're a Christian mother and father this morning, it doesn't begin at Sunday school. And it doesn't begin at crash. And it doesn't begin at Bible class. And it doesn't begin at adventures. It begins in the home. Begins at the home. Do you see a godly life? A godly life is not something that can be inherited from the parents. A godly life can only be invested in that home from the parents. And here's another important lesson this morning. What the children see in the home, what they see in the home, is what is really sown into their hearts. I want you to notice the people involved in that text, and I want you to notice the period involved in that text. It's clear to be seen. It says, And there arose a generation after them. You see, Joshua was nearing the end of his life here. And he's gathering all the leaders around him. And he says in Joshua 23 and 3, I'm going back here now, and it says here, And ye have seen all that the Lord your God hath done unto you in all these nations for you, for the Lord your God is he that hath fought for you. And here we have a generation now, and they're dying out. They're passing on. And here's a generation this morning who has witnessed at first hand the greatness of God, the goodness of God, and it was a blessed privilege that this generation had. The people, the, the people, the generation that were passing on was the generation that had the great privilege of seeing God at first hand working in their day and generation. But there's coming a generation on after them, isn't there? This generation that's passing on, they witnessed God's power. They had witnessed God's blessing. Oh, my goodness, what all did they not see? Did they not see the great miracle of the crossing of the Jordan? Did they not see the great conquering of Jericho? Did they not see the great victories after victories after victories that the Lord wrought for them as they were claiming the promised land? 
And Joshua was reminding the generation passing out the great things that God had done for them. And here's, here's, take a wee look at the generation gone out now. Because this generation saw so much, and because this generation experienced so much, and because this generation witnessed the power of God and the blessing of God so much, here's a generation going out, and they had so much to pass on to the generation to come. That so much to tell their children. That so much to teach their children. Boys, think of the great stories that, that they could pass on to their children. The great stories of crossing the Jordan while in flood. The great stories of about how they conquered Jericho. The great stories about how they won battle after battle after battle. The great stories of Joshua. It's so much to pass on to the generation to come, but they failed to do it. But the big problem with the generation passing out was this. They weren't fully committed. They didn't fully go through with God. Judges 2, verse 2. And it says there, And ye shall make no league with the inhabitants of this land. Ye shall throw down their altars, but ye have not obeyed my voice. Why have ye, do, why have ye, uh, and why have ye done this? Ye disobeyed me. You see, here we have a generation going out. Yes, they saw so much. They witnessed so much. They experienced so much. But they weren't fully committed. And the generation coming after them lost out. And there arose another generation after them. Now here's the problem in the text, which knew not the Lord. And I want to point something else out, and God pointed this out to me on the other morning. The fault didn't lie with the generation coming on. The fault lay with the generation gone out. There arose a generation after them which knew not the Lord. Do you know what they did? The generation going out. Do you know what they did? They failed to obey what the Lord taught them. Back in Deuteronomy chapter number 6, 5 and 7, we read these words. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy might. And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart, and thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children, and shalt speak of them. And when thou shalt sittest in thine house, and when thou walkest by the way. Do you know the great problem of today is this? Christian parents in many homes are not sitting down with their children and teaching their children this morning the great truths of God. And I'm telling you, Christian mommy and daddy this morning, don't you believe in it up to the Sunday school teachers? Don't you believe in it up to Johnny and Caroline? Don't you believe it up to others? First and foremost, it begins. It begins with the mother and the father. It's your duty, child of God. 
It's your duty as a parent to teach your children the great truths of God, the great characters of the Bible, the great stories of Jesus and the miracles, the great parables. You know, when days gone by and days gone by, there was children and they could rhyme off the books of the Bible, just rhyme them off. There was a day gone by when children they could have rattled off the Ten Commandments like a flash out of a palm. And there was a day gone by when they knew the great characters of the Bible. But let me tell you this, there's children today and they're coming from Christian homes and they don't know the books of the Bible. And there's children in Christian homes today and they don't know the Ten Commandments. And there's children coming from this morning from Christian homes. And they know very little concerning the Word of God. There's a generation coming up after us that don't know the Lord. Boys, I mean, when I was at Sunday school, Sitting in St. James's Parish Church, we were taught the Ten Commandments. And you were taught Bible verses. And about the springtime, late springtime, we had to have our exercise done because we had to sit a Sunday school exam. And I can tell you, my parents, who weren't professing Christians, had me sitting at the table in our front living room going over and over and over and over and over and over what we learned all year in Sunday school. And that's the way it was, but I'll tell you, that's not the way it is today. Timothy said, or Paul said to Timothy, From a child thou hast known the holy scriptures which are able to make thee wise unto salvation. And I'll tell you the blessing about Timothy. He had a godly granny and he had a godly mother who taught him the great truths of the scriptures. Susanna Wesley was the mother of 19 children. And she used to sit every children on her knee, every one of them, one by one, and taught them the things of God, and then got them round in a circle, all gathered round her, just like chickens around a hen. And there she would ask them questions about the lessons they'd just learned. And out of that home there came two mighty men that turned the British Isles upside down for God. But listen, child of God, it's in the home, it's the parents. How do you spend family time with your children? If your Sunday school teacher was to sit down with your child some Lord's Day morning and ask your child, how long does your mommy and daddy spend time with you teaching you the great stories of the Bible? I wonder would you be embarrassed with their answer? You see, there arises another generation after us that knows not the Lord and the should. And as I have said, child of God, it's not just about you sitting down and teaching them. That's vital important, but it's you and how you live. If you're a wee one comes to you someday and says to you, Mommy and Daddy, why don't you stay at the Lord's table, Mum? Christians should stay at the Lord's table. How would you answer that wee child of yours? Mommy, Daddy, why are you not baptized? The Bible says we should be baptized. Why are you not baptized?
The problem today is this. We have Christian parents that are not fully committed. Right across the board today, there's a church actually in Portadown that once was an evangelical Bible-believing church. I was in it many a time, and they now have canceled their Sunday school. They think there's no call for Sunday school. Do you know what they do in Sunday school now? They don't have a Sunday school. They bring them in and they give them popcorn and sweets and they're watching Disney film. I heard recently of a Christian man who reads them stories out of Harry Potter books as they're going to bed at night. Instead of reading them the great truths of the Bible, no wonder young people's minds is warped with reading trash like that. This is the problem today, and God is pointing it out to us. And I'll tell you this, them wee totes, at that stage there are wee sponges. Man, they soak all up. And now is the time you need to be getting the Word into them. It's all right teaching them courses, and, I, and I'm not, nothing against courses and all that. But now at that stage, you need to be concentrating on getting the Word into their wee minds. Tell them about Daniel. Tell them about Moses. Tell them about Samson. Tell them about Gideon. Read them stories. Because I'll tell you what they learn when they're weans, it never leaves them, you know. Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he shall not depart from it. I'll tell you, listen, you have only one crack at it. You have only one crack at it. They'll soon be teenagers, and they'll not want to listen to you then. They'll be up and away before you know it. And I'll tell you this, there raises a generation after us which knows not the Lord. And as I have already said, if the Sunday school teacher who teaches your children took your wee child and asked your child, how long does mommy, how long does daddy sit with you and teach with you and read you Bible stories as you go to bed at night, I wonder would you be embarrassed, child of God, because mind you, if you don't, you badly should be. And never mind you, your Sunday school teacher, I'll tell you God is watching you how you put your children to bed at night. There was once a great big children's colored Bible, you know, and boys, it was great colored pictures and it's simple Bible stories every night, just turn them over, and man. It's the way you get the Word into them. And I'm saying this in the year 2017. There's a generation growing up in Kilkeel, and we're coming down with churches in Kilkeel, but yet there's a generation in this town knows absolutely nothing about the Bible. And years ago, even the unsaved home, children knew the Ten Commandments, and they were taught the books of the Bible. But there's a generation growing up after us which knew not the Lord. Do you see the people involved in the text were talking about children? Do you see the problem which knew not the Lord? But here's the peril nor yet the works which he had done for Israel. In the book of Exodus, chapter 1, verse 6, we read these words. And Joseph died and all his brethren, and all that generation. In verse 8, we read this, And there rose up a new king that knew not Joseph. After all, Joseph did. After all, he did. There was a generation come up that didn't even hear about Joseph. What frightens me is this. If we fail to teach our children the Word of God, 
And if we fail to teach our children to follow Christ, be assured of this this morning, the world out there will teach them not to. Take a wee look at that text as a close. And there arose another generation after them which knew not the Lord, nor yet the works which he had done for Israel. Does your child know what Jesus did for them? Does our children know what Jesus did for us? The problem is not lying with the children, folks. The problem is lying with us. How are they expected to know if they don't hear it from us? You've only one crack at it. Don't waste it. And do you know what we all need today? And the man on the pulpit needs it maybe more than everybody else. Do you know what we need? We all need today, and I'm including myself here. I'm standing before you and I'm saying this. Do you know what we all need? We all need a closer walk with God. We're not going to sing any hymn this morning. We're just going to close in prayer. And we're going to leave this with the Lord. And we're going to leave it this morning with ourselves. And let's burn a wee word of prayer. Lord, your word teaches us 